Let's pray together. Lord, we do extol you for your faithfulness, that you never change in your person, your character, your purposes, nor your promises. In a tumultuous world, you are a rock. You are reliable and trustworthy. And you are trustworthy not only to fulfill the demands of your justice, and to punish sin, you are also faithful to forgive where you have promised to do so. That your mercies to us are new every morning. We recognize that when the prophet Jeremiah penned the chorus to the song we just sang, he was overlooking the destructive siege of Jerusalem. And your faithfulness to your own promise to punish your people for idolatry. And recounting your promise to bring them one day to faith and repentance and life in you. We thank you that you keep your promises. That what you purpose comes to pass. Lord, our world is not like this. We ourselves are not like this, fickle and frail. But you are our God, and you're faithful. And we praise you for it. Help us this evening as we look into your word to trust again in who you are and what you do. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles this evening to Daniel chapter 8. Last week we looked at Daniel chapter 7 and we studied that awful period of time, the worst period of human history there will ever be, that great tribulation, when the beast rules on the earth, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. That, of course, was distant future, and this evening we look at Daniel chapter 8. This is near future for Daniel. It is 400 years into the future from Daniel's perspective. Of course, for us, that makes it history. What we are looking at tonight and uh, in the weeks to come as we look at Daniel chapter 8 will have taken place 2,200 years ago. And this gives us a remarkable window into prophetic predictions. When the Bible tells us something about what will come to pass, some of those things are outstanding for us. That is still out in the distant future, but some of those predictions have already been fulfilled. Daniel 8 is one of those. And we get to see in exquisite detail the way the actual fulfillment of visionary prophecy comes to pass. This, of course, gives us a confidence in our Bibles. It gives us a confidence in what is predicted that is still yet future. If detailed predictive prophecy comes to pass the way Daniel 8 did, then we ought to pay close attention to predictive prophecy that is still out in the future. Let's read together. This evening we're going to look at the first 14 verses of Daniel 8. And this is the next vision Daniel receives. We read here God's word. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam. And I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Ulai Canal. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram butting westward, northward, and southward, and no other beasts could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue from his power. But he did as he pleased. And magnified himself. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came up to the ram that had the two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him, and he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. 
Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down. And even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? He said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. We have in these 14 verses another vision given to the prophet Daniel. We see first the setting of this vision. We have an outline to outline the vision. Point number one is simply the setting, and this is in the first two verses. Notice what Daniel says. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king. So notice we are still in the Babylonian empire at this point. Even though the narrative sections of Daniel has taken us beyond the Babylonian empire, he is working backwards now to visions he had while Belshazzar was king. And remember that the vision of Daniel chapter 7 occurred in the first year of the king Belshazzar. And so this is two years after the vision of Daniel 7. This is probably 550 B.C. Daniel is 70 years old. In terms of geopolitics, this is also the period of time where Cyrus has established the Medo-Persian Empire. And the world would have been watching these momentous events. A new empire, new conquest, a new war, more captivities, displacements of peoples and disruptions of lives. There would be much angst on the world scene. Daniel says, verse 2, I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam. Susa was the capital city of a region called Elam. This is 220 miles east of Babylon. Babylon is modern-day Iraq. Elam would have been modern-day Iran. And so this is east of the Babylonian Empire. This is where Esther and Nehemiah both resided. And this scene probably takes place not in person, although it's likely that Daniel had been to Elam on the king's business. Notice verse 2, I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel. And then notice the end of verse 2, I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Ulai Canal. So it seems likely that Daniel is seeing himself in Elam, in the province of Elam, in the, the fortress city called Susa whether or not he's actually there personally. So that's the setting. Secondly, in this vision, we see a ram, verses 3 and 4. And and as we've seen in the past, these empires that God describes in these prophetic prophecies are depicted as animals and sometimes strange animals. We have in this vision in Daniel chapter 8 a a ram with two horns, and one of them is longer than the other, and then a goat with a horn out the middle of between his eyes, and then four horns, and then a little horn growing out of the other one. These are strange beasts. The ram is described in verses 3 and 4. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram had two horns. It was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long. One was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. And I saw the ram butting or goring or thrashing about westward, northward, and southward. And no beasts could stand before him. Nor was there anyone to rescue from his power. But he did as he pleased and magnified himself. This ram uh, is described as one who had autonomy. He had a totalitarian rule and an army at his behest to go wherever he wanted and do what he wanted to do. 
That ram's end comes in verse 5. This is point 3 on your outline. A goat defeats the ram. Look at verse 5. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching, touching the ground. Here we have something of a hovering goat. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. And he came up to the ram. The ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. And I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him. And he struck the ram and shattered his two horns. And the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. The end of the ram at the behest of this goat. This goat is able to do whatever it wants against the ram which had been able to do whatever it wanted. Point number four in your outline, we discover the horns of the goat. Verse eight, then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. As soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. And in its place, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven or the directions north, south, east, and west. Verse 9, out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. We find this goat with one horn and then four horns. And a little horn coming out of one of the four horns. Point number five in your outline, the audacious little horn. We find out more about this final little horn that comes out of the four. Look at verse 10. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth. And it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. And it removed the regular sacrifice from him. And the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice. It will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking. And another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? While the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? He said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. This audacious little horn from the goat will do blasphemous things. Raise himself to the height of the host of heaven. Trample down stars. Compete for the prince of the host. Desecrate the sanctuary, the temple. Abolish regular sacrifices. And then his end will come. What does all this mean? Well, that's verse 15 to 27, and that's for a future sermon. There is a divine explanation of the details of this vision, and that's coming. And we're not going to take the time tonight to unfold all of those details. They are remarkable, and they are precise, and they can be traced through every version of the history of this time period. And to let the cat out of the bag, we're, we're talking about the Medo-Persian Empire and the Grecian Empire in this ram and goat vision. We'll unfold the details of those next week. If you want to, or not next week, uh, next time we're in Daniel. And if you want to um, bone up on your Medo-Persian and Greek history in the meantime, it will not hurt. It is, in fact, fascinating to watch these details unfold. This vision that Daniel gives is, again, future to Daniel. It happens 400 years after he sees the vision. 
It is not the distant eschatological future of the end times. And from our vantage point, again, the details of this vision have already been fulfilled and have been fulfilled in remarkable detail. What I want to do for the remainder of our time this evening is zoom out a little bit and think about prophecy. Think about predictive prophecy and its place in our Bibles and its place in our lives. You might wonder for a moment, well, why does Daniel need to give all of these details about eschatological, far distant future, the very end of time details? And then why does he need to give details about something that will take place 400 years future to his time, that takes place a long time before the other events he described? Why near details and why far details in predictive prophecy? What is the point? What is the purpose? Is is the purpose of prophecy in our Bible so that somebody could invest wisely in the stock market or bet on baseball or have some curiosity niche to show off to others about what he knows about what will transpire? Everybody loves to get the inside scoop and be the first to report a story. What about being first to report a story that hasn't happened yet? There's an intellectual fascination with these kinds of things. Why are they in the Bible? And why are they so precise? So I want to zoom out just a little bit, get some altitude, and and think about why the Bible gives details about the future at all. Why are these things important? Why has God seen fit to provide His people with predictions, with eschatology, and the details of future events? Well, one reason for that, of course, is God's own identity as the sovereign God of history and as the only true God. Turn to Isaiah, and we'll look at a couple of texts in this monumental section of Isaiah. We'll look at Isaiah 41 to begin with. You see, God predicates His own identity as the one true God on His ability to tell the future. So this is something of an apologetic for God's existence and God's veracity, God's identity, His integrity, and His peerlessness. He has no rivals. In fact, He says to the idols of Isaiah's day, and specifically to the people who would be tempted to worship the idols from God's people Israel, and says, present your case, verse 21 of Isaiah 41. Bring forward your arguments. Verse 23, declare the things that are going to come afterwards that we may know that you are gods. Look, you want to prove that you're a god and not just some made-up piece of metal that a man carved or something a guy made out of a felled tree? Prove it. Tell the future. That is God's charge to any rivals. What is the implication of that? The one true God, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible does tell the future. And you can bank on the fact that you are worshiping the one true God when you've located the one who tells the future. Why? Because he writes it. He orchestrates it. He's sovereign over it. He knows the end from the beginning. Look over at Isaiah 44 and verse 28. Here's what God says through Isaiah. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. Cyrus um, was the one who founded the Medo-Persian Empire and conquered the Babylonian Empire in 539 BC. That was still future in Isaiah's day, and God names him by name before his mother did. That is precision in predictive prophecy that predicates God as the one true God with no rivals. No one else can do that. This is just bound up in God's identification of Himself as the only true God. Look at Isaiah 46, verse 9. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. 
calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it. So that is just, number one, a theological, God-glorifying, God-ordered reason for predictive prophecy in your Bible. So that when something happens and we read it in the history books, and we've already read it in God's predictive prophecy books, we recognize that the author of history is the sovereign God of Israel. He's in charge. This goes back to the very theme of Daniel, that he's in charge. It goes back to the very identity that the God of Israel has no rivals. What I want to focus on this evening is a second reason that the Bible gives predictions. And the second reason is simply this. There are practical implications for living for God's people in predictive prophecy. It informs us how to think, how to live. Others have appropriately called this ethical eschatology that is bound up in the Bible's presentation of end times events, end times warnings, predictive prophecy is an ethic, a way to live your life. There is a therefore attached to all of these prophetic predictions. This is true throughout the scriptures. Instructions that direct how we live. It reorients our thinking. It motivates urgent living. It causes us to view people and possessions and trials from an eternal perspective. I want us to see some of these things this evening by way of example. And these examples will not be exhaustive but just a handful of them this evening. And before we look at the list of examples, I want to remind us that fundamentally, every Christian is eschatological. That is, as a Christian, you are designed, redeemed, to look forward. It is one of the fundamental definitions of a Christian. Eager anticipation of Christ's return is one of the ways that the New Testament defines a Christian. If you ask yourself, what is a Christian? Uh, one answer from the New Testament is someone looking forward to Jesus coming back. That's a Christian. I want you to see this in just a couple of places. It's in many more than this. But look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul is writing to the Thessalonian believers and he's reporting to them how others have reported about their faith. And he says this, They themselves report about, uh, about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. So here we have repentance from idols to serve. You turned to serve. The little infinitive phrase to serve completes the idea of repentance or turning from idols. You turn from idols to do what? To serve God. And notice in verse 10, there's an and connecting this and another little infinitive phrase, to wait. And that to wait is connected to the main idea of turning to God, just like to serve is connected to it. So you have turn to God in order to do two things. What are those two things? To serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who rescues us from the wrath to come. You have been rescued, Christian, in order to serve God and to wait. This word to wait here just means to eagerly anticipate, to wait eagerly for something. In this case, to wait eagerly for the arrival of Jesus Christ. Christian, does that define your life? Do you wake up in the morning and say, could it be today? Could your life be defined by others as, oh, I know what that guy's doing. He's serving the living and true God and he's waiting for Christ to come back. That's what a Christian is, according to this verse. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4.
Paul describing to Timothy his own swan song. This is his, the end of his life and ministry. He says in verse 6, I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And notice this phrase. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. Who gets eternal life? Paul and every Christian. How is a Christian defined in this verse? Those who have loved His appearing. That's what a Christian is. One who loves the appearing of Christ. And notice the contrast of verse 10. For Demas, having loved This present world has deserted. It's a sobering contrast. A Christian is one who loves Christ's appearing. You can have the whole world. I want Jesus. Can't wait till he comes back. And then there are others who say, "Mm, I think I want the world. A Christian is one who looks forward to Christ's coming. To be a Christian is to think often on eschatology. Let's just think about prayer for a moment. In the New Testament, we get an initial instruction on prayer from Jesus to the disciples. Remember one of the elements of that? Your kingdom come. That's a command. Pray this. Pray, Christians. Your kingdom come. That is a future eschatological hope that Christians are to pray. When you pray, pray this way. This ought to be on your heart as a longing regularly. What's the last prayer of the Bible? Come, Lord Jesus. The last disciple of the originals on the earth closes the Bible with his own closing prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. From the beginning of instruction in the New Testament on prayer to the very last prayer in the New Testament, it is that longing. It is eschatological. And think about the Lord's table. Every time we gather together around the Lord's table, we are proclaiming Jesus' death. We're looking backwards. Until He comes. And we're looking forwards. Every time we gather together to proclaim the Lord's death, we are doing so until He arrives. Listen, this is the Christian hope. This is Christian waiting. This is eager anticipation. It is a looking forward. So before we even look at examples of an ethical eschatology, of how eschatology in the Bible is not portrayed for some mere intellectual fascination, but for actual Christian practical living, we just start with the fundamental definition that a Christian is one who's looking forward to Christ's coming. A Christian is by nature eschatological. I'm going to give you a dozen examples or so. We'll see how far we get. Um, Number one, Philippians 3.20. There's a second outline, second sermon, 12 points. The points are simply passages we're going to look at together to get a flavor of the way God directs our living, particularly through eschatological thinking. Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. There are eschatological realities here. By the way, our citizenship in heaven is not one of them. That's a present reality in this text. You are already, Christian, a citizen of a place you've not yet been. Your residence now is not your home. Heaven is home. You are a citizen of heaven. That's a present reality. But there are end times realities in this verse. We are, what are we waiting for? Our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will return. We are looking forward to transformation. That is a resurrection, rapture event, whereby 
our humble bodies, you, maybe you've never thought about your own body as a body of humiliation, that's literally what the text says, your body of humiliation will be transformed to be into conformity with his glorious resurrection body. And how will Jesus do that to you? By the exertion of the power that he has to subject all things to himself. So you remember that day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, even his enemies? The power that Jesus has to make Satan do exactly what Jesus wants? The time when Satan will pluck the, the beast and the false prophet and throw them alive into the lake of fire? Remember that power? That's the power he will use to transform your humiliation body into resemblance to his glorious resurrection body. Those future realities are not just a matter of casual interest for us. They are actually driven by an ethic in this chapter. Look back at verse 17. Brethren, Paul says, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. That is in Paul and his faithful associates. Verse 18, for many walk, here's a contrast, of whom I've often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. And Paul here is not talking about people outside the church. He is talking about infiltrators in the church that Christians would be tempted to follow who have exchanged the message of suffering and following for Christ for a your best life now kind of message. You can have Jesus and you can have the best things you want right now. And they were advocating a worldly approach to life in the church, advocating this before Christians. Paul says, don't follow their example. They've overturned Philippians 1.21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. They said, yeah, for me, for me to die, I'll get Christ, but for me now, live, gain. Right? Look at what they said in verse 19. Look what Paul says about them. Their end is destruction. These are not true believers. Their God is their appetite. That is, they just follow and bow down and worship at every impulse and appetite that comes around. Their glory is in their shame. That is, they actually revel in things that are shameful and they set their minds on earthly things. What is the ethical directive here? Be like Paul, not like those guys. What is the informational fuel for that? For our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait the Lord Jesus Christ and he will transform our bodies with the power he has to subject all things. Your eschatology drives the way you think about present life in Philippians 3. All right, number two, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast, immovable, laboring for Christ. And it's not in vain. Those are ethical directives. How to live the Christian life with urgency. What is it grounded in? Well, we're in 1 Corinthians 15. This is that great chapter about the resurrection and the rapture. You need to know about the resurrection. And you need to know about the rapture. Listen, bodies sown into the ground in weakness will be raised in power. Bodies sown in dishonor will be raised in glory. Bodies sown natural will be raised supernatural. And in the twinkling of an eye, we who are alive will go to meet Christ, be transformed. Those are realities that Paul puts forward with this ethical imperative, verse 58, therefore, resurrection, rapture, therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And your work is not in vain. This is a pattern. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I think I've uh, told this story about myself to my shame a number of times. Forgive me. 
uh, if you've heard this before. A number of years ago, I led a one another's study in my small group and went through all the one another commands of Scripture. Confess your sins to one another. Sing to one another in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Don't sue one another. Don't lie to one another. You know, all of those one another commands. And encourage one another. I thought that was a great command. Um, Comfort one another. That's another great command. And I gave as a proof text, 1 Thessalonians 4.18, comfort one another. So you think about comforting someone. Uh, Okay, someone's sad, I need to give them comfort. What biblical truths can I use to give somebody comfort? And and we just sort of talked about things that would be comforting when someone was sad. You know, it comes from 1 Thessalonians 4. You know what 1 Thessalonians 4 is about? Look back at verse 13. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as the rest who have no hope. For if, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. We say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be harpazoed together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall be always with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What are these words? Well, this is the pre-tribulational harpazo. Harpazo. Why, do, why am I saying that? It sounds like harpoon. Yeah, it is like a harpoon, and it's being snatched away violently. That's what the word means. It means that every single time it's used in the Bible. Um, it is a uh, snatching away. And you may think, well, I've never seen the word rapture in my Bible, but it's right here. It's this word. Uh, the New American Standard says, caught up. We will be caught up. There is a command here in 1 Thessalonians 4.18 to comfort one another with the truth of the rapture. That is, to not comfort one another with this truth would be something like disobedience, neglect. It's a problem. And it's problematic to just say, well, I want to comfort people with truth. No, Paul specifically says, comfort one another with this truth. So there's an ethical imperative there, um, and it is specifically the rapture will happen, therefore comfort others with it. Turn to John 14, number four. In my Father's house, Jesus said, are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And a couple of eschatological truths are here. One is many mansions in Jesus' Father's house. Um, Jesus' departure from the earth to go and prepare those for his people And then Jesus return, and notice the details of the return in verse 3. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That is not a Revelation 19 return of Jesus to the earth. That is Jesus coming for his people, receiving them to himself, that they may be where he is. This again is a pre-tribulational rapture passage. And so you have two significant eschatological truths here. Jesus preparing many mansions in his Father's house for believers and a word about the rapture. And the ethical imperative is in verse 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. Don't be troubled. Look, There are troubles in this world. There are troubling things in this world. There is significant comfort to be taken, Christian, from truths about the end times. Details about what will happen in the future according to God's promise. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, number 5. First Corinthians 
And I know we're parachuting into passages here. Uh, Paul is talking about the labor of his own apostolic ministry and his associates and how they built the foundation of the church, which is apostolic doctrine. The foundation which was laid was Christ. And the, the apostles and the New Testament prophets are laying the foundational truth that the rest of church history builds upon. He says, verse 10, According to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, another man is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. This is one of the passages dealing with the Bema Seat judgment of Christ. That is the judgment of rewards for believers during the church age as they build this temple, this building, this edifice called the church, the foundation of which is Christ, and every successive layer of church history has been building on top of it. We are on something like the 2022nd floor of that building. What is the ethical imperative flowing out of the reality that each man's life work and all the ministry that is a part of building up the church, a part of which every believer is involved. What is the ethical imperative flowing out from the reality that all of that will be tested by fire, scrutinized by heaven, and the stuff that was good lasts and the stuff that was not is incinerated? What's the imperative? Be careful how you build. Verse 10. It means we don't build on the foundation which is Christ with stuff that won't stand the scrutiny of eternity. We want to be careful about the materials we use, that is, what we do and the methods by which we do it than the motives by which we do them. All of those things scrutinized by heaven we will find that God rewards that which he produces. And the things we did from selfish interest and with bad materials, you do things the wrong way off script and you do things for the wrong reasons, for self-glorification, um, bad motives, it will it'll burn up. So be careful how you live. Be careful how you build. This eschatological reality informs our present living. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy 4, 1 to 10 details apostasy in later days. The Spirit explicitly says, verse 1, that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits, doctrines of demons, hypocrisy of liars. He says down in verse 7, have nothing to do with worldly fab fables. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And then look down at verse 10. It is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God. Hope drives labor and striving. The predictive promise from God that in later times there will be apostasies and seared consciences and false teachers informs Christians how to respond to them. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you're a good servant of Jesus Christ. And discipline yourself unto godliness. Don't be one who falls away, falls victim to false teaching. Look over at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Number 7 on the list this evening. Paul says, realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, etc., etc., etc. There is a last days worldwide, self-absorbed sinfulness coming. Therefore, verse 5, 
avoid such men as these. Paul tells Timothy, in the last days, this is what the world's going to look like. Right now, avoid guys like that. That is an eschatological promise informing present living. 1 Peter 3.15, number 8. Perhaps a familiar verse. Set apart or sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, keeping a good conscience. First Peter is written to Christians who are suffering. How does Christ shine in your life as Lord when you suffer well and godly? And it informs our evangelism. And what drives those things? Hope. You are to give an account of the hope that is in you. That is that future-looking confidence in God's promises. Helps Christians endure suffering and keep an integrity in our witness in the world. All right, let's flip back to Jeremiah 29. It's good to see one Old Testament prophecy and its ethical imperative, which has particular implications for the book of Daniel. Jeremiah 29, 10. For thus says Yahweh, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place, that is back to Jerusalem. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares Yahweh, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. So this isn't eschatological for us. This has already been fulfilled. The 70 years came and went and the people went back to Jerusalem. God knew the plans that he had for them and he fulfilled them. It's done. This is history for us. Um, and, and there's a monument to that history just down the street. I drive past it on my way home from here uh, on Warner Boulevard. There is now the uh, 2911 church. I don't know if you've seen it. New building, new sign, parking lot full. A great testimony to the truth of this verse. And I, I'm confident that, um, well, I hope that what they mean is God kept his promise already for Israel to do this very thing. But what is the imperative? Um, look back at verse 5, uh, verse 4. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent in the ex into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, do this. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and become the fathers of sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will have welfare. And don't fall victim to false teaching. There are very explicit commands given to Israel based on a future promise. For 70 years will come and go and I'll bring you back to Jerusalem. I know the plans I have for you. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. There's a command here in verse 2 to study prophecy. Peter says, You should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. And then he talks about the coming of the day of the Lord. That is a command to study prophecy. Look down at verse 11. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. So we get a command to study prophecy, and the effect of that on us is to encourage godly living. Number 11 is 1 John 3, 2 and 3, and I'll just allude to it here. We are not yet what we will be. We will see Christ and we will be like him for we will see him. That's coming. Seeing Christ and being transformed by him. And then John says, everyone who holds on to this purifies himself. 
there is a present sanctification benefit to thinking about those eschatological realities. Last one on the list this evening is Revelation 22. In verse 7, Jesus said, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is the one who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. What's the eschatological reality? Jesus is coming back soon. What's the ethical imperative? Read the book of Revelation. That's what we're supposed to do. To know what it says. To heed it. So Christian, what should our attitude be toward eschatology? Let me give you a few knots first. Here's what our attitude should not be. Indifferent. Thinking eschatology is unimportant. We shouldn't just tuck it away. It's controversial, therefore we shouldn't study it. Nothing in the Bible tells you it's controversial and therefore you shouldn't study it. The Bible says the opposite. We shouldn't stop and say, well, that's just difficult. So I'm going to leave it alone. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible gives clear details about the future with imperatives about how that should affect our present lives. We should not be speculative, uh, some sort of curiosity and mental stimulation just to think about things we think are somehow entertaining. We should not use eschatology to make a name for ourselves by some niche speculative innovation. That we should not decide for ourselves what is important in God's Word and what ought to be left behind. Boy, I didn't mean that pun. No pun intended on the left behind comment. It just came out. It's bizarre. We should not reject a study of eschatology simply because others have done it poorly or carnally. You know the principle that bad men make good doctrine look bad. Right? That doesn't make the doctrine itself bad. That doesn't make the truth bad. Bad men mar truth. So reject the badness of bad men and embrace the truth in all of its beauty. That should not be a ground of excuse before the Lord of ignoring his word. Right? To, to stand before Jesus one day and say, okay, yeah, I read that in the Bible, but there were these guys who believed it so strongly and they weren't good. It's not a good excuse. So what should our attitude be toward eschatology? Um, 2 Timothy 3.16, all eschatology, all biblical eschatology, all scriptural eschatology is profitable for teaching, correcting, for reproof, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped. So we are to believe, to think on, to encourage each other with, and to proclaim God's truth, to embrace, to hope, to calibrate our worldviews, to live, to evangelize, to build the church, all fueled by God's truths. And our attitude ought to be that of Jude 3, contending earnestly for apostolic doctrine over and against false teaching. To contend earnestly. What, what does it mean to contend earnestly for the faith once for all handed down to the saints? That body of doctrine that came from Christ through his apostles and the New Testament prophets for the building up of his church. Listen, every New Testament book contains eschatology. We must contend earnestly for it. It has been handed down to us from the apostles and the prophets. We must faithfully contend for it. That implies detractors in a fight, and we must pass it on to the next generation. I'll close with some bookends from the book of Revelation. Revelation 1.3 begins with this promise from Christ. Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things that are written in it. For the time is near. And then the bookend blessing promise again in 22.7. I am coming quickly, says Christ. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. God's eschatological predictions, God's prophetic utterances, they serve to identify the one true and living God. It can be verified in history whenever history has come and gone past the predictive events. But they also serve to fuel godly living for God's people of all ages. We need these truths. So as we're making our way through the book of Daniel, 
The goal is not speculative interest in some strange phantasmical views, but for the very purposes God gave it to us, to encourage holy living, an eternal perspective, to have God's view on the world, and even to think about people around us the way we ought. C.S. Lewis in his essay, The Weight of Glory, said, you have never met a mere mortal. Every single person you meet will live, will exist into eternity. And listen, thinking about the future will remind us why we are here. Let's pray. Lord, we think about the world around us and a sea of humanity, a mass of rebellion against you that desperately needs the saving grace of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you be pleased to cause us to be heavenly minded? to be eagerly anticipating your return, comforting one another with truths like the resurrection and rapture event, uh, your return, your coming kingdom, preaching the good news of that coming kingdom, praying for its coming, longing for your appearing. Lord, I'm convinced if we thought about these things well, yea, every day, reminded one another of these things, we would be laboring and striving and not in vain. We ask that you give us aid to all of this. The time is short. We trust you. We want to glorify you with our moments on this earth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.